allow you to love us, Lord. Sometimes what we've been through in life make us to block your love. But today we're saying, no, Lord, break every wall, Lord, so that you may reside inside of us, so that we may allow and receive your love in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that we may just hear you, Lord, direct from you in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I'd like to invite you to take a seat. Thank you so much, family, for just coming together this morning so that we can join together as we praise the Almighty God. Before we have Pastor Kevin come up, there are a few announcements I'd like to share with you. And so the first has to do with a marriage seminar that we're preparing. So we have a guest who is coming through from Johannesburg. He's going to be with us uh, for a, a couple of days, Friday night and a Saturday morning. And it is a seminar that is on communication. We recognize that marriages are really important and that words are so powerful that we really need to bring that into our marriages. So please do join us for that July 14th and 15th. Okay. Then we also got Mauritius and Serene van der Vestesen who are offering a marriage seminar. And that goes on. It's a weekly seminar where couples come together. And for both of these, you can sign up at the reception. Um, but please, there are two different seminars, but both are beneficial and valuable. And if you can't make the ten, uh, sorry, the eight-week investment into communication, then let's go for the for the power seminar on the 14th and 15th. Also, as we get the life groups coming together, it really is important that you be built up and you have that midweek recharge. So if you're not part of a life group, please do join one. There, is, there are life groups that meet here at the building in various places. So come together on a Wednesday evening at six o'clock. But ideally, if you can find a life group in your area that you can be a part of, you'll really grow in your faith and, and have that word just go deeper into your heart, change your life. And as we think about that and recognize that we are in a spiritual war, I'd like you to give Pastor Kevin a really big hand as he comes forward. Almighty, loving God and Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for providing Pastor Kevin to just teach us and lead us and guide us. And we thank you for your anointing on his life. I pray that as we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word, that you will work powerfully through him in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, it's a really wonderful day to be able to worship God, isn't it? This morning, can I ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, I bless you to be filled with joy. How many of us need some joy? <laughs> I pray that the Lord will open your eyes to his love for you. I pray that the Lord will open your heart to his joy for you this morning. You know, last week we ended the series on abiding in God's love and we, we talked about how God calls us to abide in his love, to receive his love and flow in his love. I've learned that whilst abiding in God's love, the reality is there is a spiritual war that's going on. There's a battle that's going on that's trying to bend us out of shape. Have you noticed that? Yes. Trying to get us to drag us into unforgiveness, into offense, into bitterness, into maliciousness. It's, it really is sometimes like... A, like we get baptized in lemon juice, walking around as if we're eating and sucking on lemons. And, and the Lord would have us walk in the joy of the Lord and the grace of God and the love of God. He wants you to enjoy the fullness of His joy. The scripture says, in His presence is the fullness of joy. The problem is that many of us, many people, many people, do not believe that there's a spiritual war that exists that can actually affect them. Sadly, many people do not believe that there's a spiritual war that can affect them. In fact, for those that do believe that a spiritual war can affect them, I've noticed that most of the time 
when they're in it, they don't know they're in it. And so they're eating lemons instead of sharing the love and the joy of the Lord. They're offended with their spouse. They're offended with their employer. They're just offended with them. They don't recognize the spiritual warfare that is going on. How many of you agree that you've been there before? So there are people that do not recognize that they're in spiritual war and do not believe that the spiritual war affects them. And then there's the other extreme of the people that believe that there's a demon behind every bush. (laughs) And they blame everything on the devil. Satan made me do it. (laughs) How many of us have heard that? I believe, just I want to try and show you how this works. If I can ask Pastor Julius and Pastor Steve if they can help me and you can pray for me as I try and show this this, uh, short demonstration to show you what I believe happens. Because I believe the Word of God is very clear that every one of us can be impacted positively and negatively by the environment that we're in because we're all in a spiritual war. As they get these containers out and put this plank here, imagine this plank represents your heart. And as you see the heart that's there, the problem is many of us hear things. Tell your neighbor, hear things. We hear things. When I was a child, I remember hearing someone say to me, Uh, as they thought they were joking, they said to me, Kevin, do you really think you've got the gift of singing? (laughs) I said, why? He said, because all you do is make a horrible noise. (laughs) And when I heard that as a small child in boarding school, I stopped singing because I felt I couldn't sing. And then I saw the scripture when I became a born-again Christian that the Lord calls us to make a joyful noise. So I was okay with just singing, but it took me a while. It held me back. So imagine you receive some news that you're abandoned. Maybe you've heard some news that you're abandoned, and maybe you've heard some more news that a friend betrayed you, You, your supervisor betrayed you. You receive the noise, don't you? You hear it. And you start bending under the weight of the news. You're no longer the same shape. In fact, you're bent out of shape. How many of you have been bent out of shape before? And then you hear some news that the economy for the future is not going to go very well. You know that there's a cash flow that's struggling through the nation. And so the news comes. What about the news that, you know, the doors aren't opening for education or for the future? It looks like that the future education is limited because the economy is limited. And how many of you recognize you bend out of shape? (laughs) What about the news that COVID comes and the doors are closed? The markets are closed. And then you lose a loved one, the news of losing a loved one, the disappointment of having lost a loved one. And you continue to bend out of shape. What about the fact that the church let you down? They weren't there for you. They didn't pray for you. They didn't stand with you in your eyes and your mind. What about the fact that maybe the business closed down and you lost the job? And then you look into the market and you see social uprising. Tell your neighbor, social uprising. (laughs) And you find yourself completely bent out of shape. Can you really operate in full strength from this place? 
then you find your spouse wasn't being honest with you. You find your father, your family wasn't honest to you. You found your employer disappointed you. And you start to crack. One more lie. Many of us have come into church like this, bent out of shape, just believing the stories, taking the lies, and allowing the lies and the things that you hear and you see to shape you. I wanted to put you to recognize that I believe that God wants us to abide in love but not get bent out of shape. I believe Holy Spirit wants to minister to us this morning to recognize that you have been given authority against these lies. But you have to take that position. You have to take that spiritual authority. Can you tell your neighbor, reclaim spiritual authority? I really believe God wants you to abide in love, but he needs you in abiding in love to reclaim your spiritual authority. I want to give you three quick points. The first one is, I want you to recognize this morning, there really are demons that exist. There are demons. And I know some of you believe that, but I want to remind you, you have an enemy and it's not just your flesh. Yes, our flesh is our enemy. But we need to recognize a few things. There are really demons. Let's go to Matt, Mark chapter 5, verse 2. The scripture says, When Jesus had come out of the boat, immediately there met a man there from the tombs with an unclean spirit. This man had an unclean spirit. He was influenced by demons. He'd been dwelling amongst the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had pulled, been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Something is really wrong here. People tried to help him and couldn't help him. Society tried to help him and couldn't help him. Something is really wrong. And whilst that's an extreme picture, when I use the word demonized, many of us would immediately go to this picture of this person. And therefore, we would think we've never been demonized. I'm not talking about demon possessed. I'm talking about demonized. Let me just help you. The word demonized means to be pushed by or influenced by the devil. And let me remind you that every one of us in this room has at some point in time been influenced by the devil. If you agree with me, just put up your hand. Every one of us have believed a lie. Satan is the father of lies. So he creates circumstances. He creates situations. He gets us to hear things that we interpret and we believe the lie and allow it to bend us out of shape. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 to 11, out of the Passion Translation, the scripture says, If you freely give anyone, if you freely forgive anyone for anything, then I also forgive you. And if I've forgiven anything, I did so for, for you before the face of Christ. Look at this. So we would not be exploited by the adversary Satan, for we know his clever schemes. Sorry, can you say to your neighbor his clever schemes? So let's get this. One of the lies that he puts on us is that you don't have to forgive. But the scripture says that if you don't forgive, you're used by Satan in his clever schemes. When you live in unforgiveness, you're being influenced, you're being pushed by the devil. 
2 Timothy 2.26 is very clear. He says there, pray that they come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. He's talking about Christians being caught in unforgiveness, in offense, having been taken captive by Satan in order to perform his will. In other words, you can be a Christian and be influenced by the lies. God says, forgive, you don't. God says, bless, you don't. God says, release, you don't. Scripture tells us in Proverbs 18.21 is a good one. God says, speak life. Look at this in Proverbs 18.21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. <laughs> we know the Scripture says, the reckless tongue brings destruction, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. But still, you find us speaking reckless words over people. Ah, he's just a mampumpan. <laughs> ah, he's just a fool. Ah, he's that one. He's just, and yet God tells you, speak life. Tell your neighbor, speak life. <laughs> but you'll find many of our sense of humor is at the expense of other people, and we speak reckless words over them. Proverbs 6 verse 2 says this, you are snared by your own words, the words of your mouth. You are taken by the words of your mouth. So many of us are recklessly speaking destruction, not realizing the thing that we're speaking is we are repeating the lies of Satan into our relationships. And by the time we started speaking We've absorbed the thoughts and, and, and the scripture has told us, he's told us take every thought captive, not some thoughts, every thought captive and submit it to Christ. After the thoughts, we start speaking destruction. Here's a thought for you to chew on. The scripture says, the truth shall set you free. Tell your neighbor the truth shall set you free. If the scripture says the truth shall set you free, what does believing a lie do? It'll bend you out of shape. And the next thing is, you're not as strong as you should be. You're not receiving love. In fact, the scripture says that when you're out of shape, when you're offended, when you're, when you're living in unforgiveness, the scripture actually says, when the good comes, you will not even see it as good. Let me say it again. When the good comes, you will not even see the good when it comes. Because you're so bent out of shape, you think there's a trap here, there's a trick here, there's something wrong here. You're so bent out of shape, you don't see the good. And there's only one good, and it's God. When God is doing something, you don't see it. You don't think it. You think it's a trap. The enemy of the devil. You forget that God can take what was meant for bad and turn it to good. If the truth can set you free, then what does a lie do? In Numbers 33, in Numbers 13, verse 33, when the Hebrews were looking at the promised land and they had seen the giants that are there, they came back with a report and listen to the scripture in Numbers 13, verse 33. The scripture says, there we saw the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so were we in their sight. That wasn't the truth. The truth is that the people in Jericho, they feared the Hebrews, but they believed a lie. And they projected the lie onto the others. So let's recognize demons are there. First Peter chapter 2, verse 17, he tells us, honor all people. Tell your neighbor, all people. all people. But how come we don't honor all people? 
How come we selective in who we honor? You see, we bent out of shape. Then the scripture says, love the brotherhood. But so many of us are offended with the church and we, we definitely don't love the brotherhood. You know, that brother has got this thing. That brother's got the, Forget about what I've got. I don't know about you, but I'm a broken pot. A cracked pot. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. There really are demons, and I believe that many times we're believing lies, and it's affecting our relationship, it's affecting the way we think, it's affecting the way we speak, it's affecting how we relate with people, and we don't even recognize it, that we're in spiritual warfare. And this second thing, let's recognize demons absolutely have a strategy. They have a strategy, and the strategy is to get you to believe his lie. It's as simple as that. His strategy is to get you to believe a lie so that he can distract you, so that he can steal, kill, and destroy God's plans for you. Look at verse 5 of Mark chapter 5. And always, day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Satan was trying to destroy this person. The Satan was trying to kill this person, and Satan has a scheme. Scripture tells us that he has schemes, and his strategy is always the same. I call it the one, two, three punch. One, two, three punch. This is it. The first thing he does, Satan's strategy, is to get you to believe the deception. It's as simple as that. Get you to believe the lie. And when you believe the lie, you're in the first step towards following Satan in following his lie. His deception is to get us to miss God's truth and follow his lie. The second thing is he's getting us to a place of deception because he wants to cause division. Division. Division means die to visions, two visions. So you don't have Father's vision, you have your own vision. Die vision. And as you join in to a, a family, it's all about your vision instead of God's vision for the family. Die vision. He's doing the deception and the division because he wants to come and destroy. His ultimate purpose is to destroy families, to destroy communities to destroy your testimony, to destroy your finances, to destroy your lives. Satan's strategy is to distract, using deception with his lie, to get you discouraged, to get you divided, to get you to doubt God's word so that he can destroy God's best for you. Let's just remember, there really are demons and demons have a strategy. James chapter 4, verse 7, James says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In other words, he calls you to respond, to take spiritual authority. Can I ask you to tell your neighbor, take spiritual authority. If you don't, you'll find yourself bending out of shape. Some people focus on the lie, the unforgiveness, the offense, instead of running to Jesus. In verse 6, when this person who was possessed saw Jesus from afar, the first thing he did, he ran and worshipped Jesus. He ran to Jesus. This man was oppressed by more than 2,000 demons. He was possessed by more than 2,000 demons. And yet, he could still run to Jesus. He still had enough self-control that he could run and submit to Jesus. Look at verse 13. Verse 9, sorry. The man, then he asked him, Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he answered saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Many. A legion was made up of between 2,000 and 6,000 Roman soldiers. So this person had more than 2,000 demons 
we know that he was oppressed and possessed. Look at verse 8. Jesus cast out the demons. He says, come out of the man, unclean spirit. And, and I want you to recognize Jesus has the authority to cast out demons. So when you're dealing with a lie that's trying to influence you, that's trying to bend you out of shape, you can't go to trying to work out the lie. You've got to run to Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You've got to go back to Jesus to abide in love, to receive God's love, because He is love. And then He wants you to take authority. How? How do you take authority? You do what the demon-possessed man did. You run to Jesus, who bowed down. He bowed down and he worshipped Jesus. Say with me, worship Jesus. As he worshipped Jesus, he gets delivered of the lies because his focus is on the truth. And by the way, when we come in to worship Jesus, I don't know about you, if I've been offended and I come into church and I start worshiping, I find my heart softens. Worship softens your heart. And as you're worshiping, what happens is God reveals His Word to you. You know, the problem with worshiping is, oftentimes, we try to worship God our way. We come in... And we think, you know what? This church is crazy. They lift their hands. I'm not going to lift my hands. I'm going to worship my way. And then you've got other people who come in and say, hey, these guys, they don't worship God's way. They keep their hands down. And me, I'm going to worship God by lifting my hands. I, I want to challenge you. God calls us to worship Him His way. And his way is different for every single person in the room because none of us are in the same place. I was thinking about loving Helen. I really enjoy diving. I get my tank filled up diving, especially dangerous dives. If I take a deep dive or a shark dive, that fills my tank. I come out excited and I'm ready for another week's work. But it doesn't fill Helen's tank. <laughs> she doesn't want to go diving. What fills Helen's tank is if I can find a place, create a space where she can look at the beauty of creation, especially the sea. If she can see the sea, if she can hear the waves, and it's a warm day where she can read a book and just have a quiet space at seeing creation and nature, wow, her tank fills up. Now, to love Helen is not to get Helen to go and make her dive with me, because that's going to make her shake, and when she comes out of the water, she's not ready for the week. To love Helen is to create the space that I do what Helen wants to do, not what I want to do. The problem with worship is we come in doing church the way we want to do it, where we are putting self on the throne. And I, I just want to remind you some, some things. The, this man, when he ran to Jesus, he immediately fell on his knees before God. That's called Barak. It's a Hebrew form of worship where God calls us to kneel before Him. Do you know that God will want you sometimes to kneel in worship? Tell your neighbor, Barak. His way of worship there is to call you to kneel. Now some of us, when we're here and we hear God saying, I want you to kneel, you think, Ooh, not me, I'm not going to kneel. You know what? That's pride. And, and I've heard, sometimes, almost every service, I've had to kneel before God, not because of theology, but because of the Word of God. And some people might say, when do I have to stop kneeling when God tells you? Worship is choosing to worship Him His way. Tell your neighbor, Barak. I am concerned for us as a church. It seems like you are perfect and you don't need to worship God's way. All of you seem perfect because you don't often express worship the way God has called you to express worship. Oh, it's gone quiet in the house. 
Let's admit we need to worship God God's way. The second form of worship, there's seven main Hebrew forms, is called todah. It's a sacrifice of worship by extension of hands in adoration for God, where God says, lift your hands and praise me. I imagine this person, when he was delivered of all 2,000 demons, I imagine he was like this, ta-da! Expression of worship and praising God. Then there's a form of worship called yada. It's the extended hand before God. Then there's a worship form called tehillah. Tell your neighbor tehillah. Not tequila. No. No, no. I rebuke that. <laughs> tehillah. And the tehillah is a form of worship where there's spontaneous praise, where you, the song is going and the worship is going, and maybe you've got the worship team singing here, and you just feel like you need to sing to God a love song. Maybe it's in tongues quietly. Maybe it's the word of God. I don't know, but it, it's a time of praising God. And maybe you're in the congregation and you hear someone going off at Tehillah and you think, hey, that's a distraction, quieten down. But you don't know what they're going through. Amen. We need more freedom in this house to be able to worship God. <laughs> Amen. Because I don't know about you, but we need to have those lies removed, yeah. that influence gone. I'd like you to trust our pastors that when there is a distraction, the pastors will walk up gently behind that person and they'll assess. They'll stand there and they'll just pray and they'll pray, is this person distracting people or is this person receiving from the Lord? Is this fruit of the flesh or is this fruit of the Spirit? If it's fruit of the Spirit, we'll let the pastors carry on and I'll share from the pulpit what's going on. Please trust us. But I don't know about you, but we need deliverance. There's so many lies we've believed. Some of you believe the lie that you're incompetent. Some of you believe the lie that you should have low self-esteem. Some of you believe the lie that you'll never make it. God says you'll make a way where there seems to be no way. God says you're an ambassador in Christ Jesus. So let's fight the lies by turning to Jesus. Another form of worship is Hallel. It's from the word hallelujah, and it means to sing praises out aloud, spontaneously, to celebrate, to dance, to cheer before God. And then there's zamar worship. It's a worship with stringed instruments, and that's what you see going on here. Shabbat is the time of addressing in a loud tone, a loud adoration, a shout. Sometimes in worship, you'll hear somebody shout to the Lord, and you're going, what's going on here? Well, maybe deliverance. Maybe God is removing the person from believing a lie. That's why it's so important to worship God's way. It's when you obey God that there's deliverance. Tell your neighbor, activate your faith. It's really important to recognize that Moses, to get a breakthrough, had to stand on the top of the mountain and God said, lift his hands. He had to lift his hands for deliverance for Israel. And then Joshua, God said, walk around Jericho seven times after he's been circumcised. That's quite a feat. <laughs> seven times for seven days he had to walk around. There was an action that was required of Moses, of Joshua, and of you. Faith, unless accompanied by action, is dead. This man with 2,000 demons had faith. He ran to Jesus because he wanted deliverance. He fell into Barak worship, and as he started worshiping God, the manifestations occurred, and Jesus cast the demons out. I believe that every one of us in a spiritual war, and we need to learn how to worship Jesus. In the place of worshiping Jesus, let him give you the robe of righteousness. Let him put you into right positioning with him. Righteousness is the right relationship with God and with others. Tell your neighbor, and others. And others. Oh, sorry. It's like we're back in England. Can I ask you to turn to your other neighbor and say a little louder, and others. And others. Let me remind you, many of you are offended and God wants you to get up and go and ask for forgiveness for withdrawing your love. Worship Jesus 
Put on the robe of righteousness. Receive the ring of authority. Remind yourself you have been given authority. You're a son, you're a daughter of the Most High God. You have authority. You don't have to be bent out of shape. You need to be repositioned in Christ. Receive that ring of authority. Take that place. By the way, Luke 21 verse 19 says, By your patience, possess your souls. God is calling you to have the lies exposed, receive the truth, and possess your souls under the Spirit of God, underneath the righteousness of God. In Luke 10, verse 17, the 70 turned with Jesus with joy and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and that's reference to demons, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. In other words, God wants you to take authority. And it's not about a demon behind every bush. It's about walking home and stepping into the house and recognizing, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. I've had really good days. I've gone home. I step into the house and suddenly I'm offended with Helen. And she hasn't said anything. She hasn't done anything. Just an offense comes on me. No one else has been like, who's married? Just put up your hand. <laughs> if you've ever had that before and you're married, could you put up your hand? Hey, some of you, I need to pray for you. Praise God. <laughs> Suddenly, I'm offended. I walk through the door. It doesn't happen much, but I walk through the door and I'm offended. And I have to recognize this is spiritual war. Yeah. And then I turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me. There's a spirit of offense on me. How do I deal with this? And I take authority in Jesus' name. I speak life. I speak blessings. There are many times Helen has to pray for me too, by the way. <laughs> if you're going to be real about this and authentic, we have to pray for each other a lot. A good picture of this for me is found in Joshua 10, verse 24. It's a time where Joshua has captured 10 kings. Imagine kings of lust, kings of, right, uh, of deceit, kings of the flesh. All these kings are there. He's captured them. And then he calls the kings out of the cave that he's hidden them. And he says to them, he says to the people there, the commanders of his army, come and put your feet on these kings' necks. Come and put your feet on the kings' necks. In other words, he's saying, you need to take authority. Can I remind you, take your authority. Some of you, you allow strife in the home when God has called you to take holy communion in the home. Some of you, you've got strife in the home and God is saying, walk around the house and pray for your family in your house. Some of you, you get woken up at 10 o'clock at night, come and pray, two o'clock in the morning, come and pray for your family. Take authority and pray the words of Jesus over your family. It's not about fighting demonic spirits, it's about coming to Jesus and speaking Jesus' words, taking the authority. So worship Jesus, receive the gift of righteousness, Receive the authority, the ring of authority, and then share what Jesus has done for you. Look at verse 15, chapter 5 of Mark. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion now sitting and clothed in right mind, and they were afraid. In verse 18, and when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged Jesus that he might be able to come with him. However, Jesus didn't permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things they what Jesus has done, especially with your children. When we have a victory and we can teach our children that we've had this victory, we share that. We share the what's and all. We share with our children appropriately. So let's recognize there are demons. Demons have a strategy. Take authority. Take authority by worshiping Jesus, by receiving the robe of righteousness. Take authority by worshiping the Lord, receiving the righteousness, receiving the ring of authority. Take authority by sharing what Jesus has done. 
And just as I end, I want to show this again to you, if I wouldn't mind, if you wouldn't mind, Steve and Pastor Julius coming up. Thank you, Pastor Steve. I hope that was a great demonstration for you. Just have a look at this. I believe that the Word of God is said clearly. It's impossible in Luke 17, 1, but that offenses will come your way. In other words, lies are going to come. The father of lies is going to use people to speak lies over you. But you need to reposition yourself. Tell your neighbor, reposition yourself. Look at these planks, simply repositioned, braced in the Word of God, filled with the Holy Spirit, so you can discern the gift of discernment, the discernment of spirits, that which is demonic, a lie, that which is of God. Now, look at what happens when the lie comes. We see that the lie comes. It's impossible, but the lies will come. Offenses will come. The lack of a future in your mind. Kevin, you haven't got a future. Kevin, you're incompetent. Kevin, there's cash flow problems. Kevin, there's a struggle in the marketplace. Let's just leave it there. It won't break. Tell your neighbor, it won't break. It won't break, <laughs> it won't break because it has been repositioned. And I'm asking you as saints as sons and daughters of the Most High, to recognize this morning, first, there are demons. You're in a war whether you like it or not. And it's coming to break your families, your finances. It's coming to break your relationships and your communities. But you need to reposition yourself. Reposition yourself in worship through the love of God. Abide in the love of God. Take authority. Can I ask you to stand this morning? Thank you, guys. I want to apologize to the worship team in advance for the, the mess that's here. I'm going to ask you, after worship if you can take Holy Communion. I believe that you need to come under the blood of Jesus again. I believe you need to receive the bread of life before you leave this room. As the worship team comes up, can I ask you just to bow your heads? And let's confess that every one of us has been proud filled with pride and shame, we've allowed lies to define us. Today we need to come back to the truth. He is love and receive from Him. Father, we come to You this morning and we ask You for forgiveness. For the lies we've believed for the lies that have bent us out of shape, got us offended, got us in unforgiveness, got us to separate from your truth. We recognize there's times that we have to draw boundaries and you tell us to draw boundaries. But today we come to you and we confess we need our heart softening. In Jesus' name. As we sing to the Lord, He's calling us out of the waters, out of the storm. He's calling us into His presence. And as we come into His presence, maybe this morning you have to barak. Maybe you need to kneel before the Lord. Maybe you need to do tahila. Maybe you need to do yada. Maybe you need to do toda or halal and as you worship him this morning can I ask you to come into the presence of Jesus and let him expose the lies and bring the truth 
and then we'll take Holy Communion together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship Him, please. Presence of my 
your son to pay the price for our sin. His body became the bread of life for us. His blood washes away our past and makes us a new creation in Christ Jesus. That we can receive your Holy Spirit. That we can walk in your inheritance for us. That we can be seated in heavenly places in Christ. And that we have the authority you intended us to have. Lord, I thank you that Jesus took legal authority and crushed the headship of Satan. Thank you that he gave us the keys of authority that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And we choose to bow before you here and now in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as you're standing there this morning, can I encourage you to consider taking Holy Communion? The elements are to my right and to your left, my left. Please can I ask you to think about taking Holy Communion, to reposition yourselves under the blood of Jesus, to walk out this morning knowing His grace is sufficient. His blood brings new life. He's a God of covenant. But as you step out, recognize you are in a spiritual war. Demons are real. They're not behind every bush. Can I remind you just for a moment? When Satan goes before God, did you know that only one angel walks Satan to the pit of hell? Not a troop of angels. Not even God himself has to walk Satan. Satan is not powerful. Satan is only as powerful as the lie you believe. There are demons. They have a strategy. Take your authority. So Father, we come before you and we reposition ourselves in holy communion through the covenant of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I know not everyone has Holy Communion elements with you. So, as we go into time now, just standing before the Lord, those who have got Holy Communion elements, please feel free to take it with your family or by yourself. But I encourage you to take it as we worship God. And in the meantime, can I ask you as saints to turn to your neighbor and say to them, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you forevermore. God bless you.